Good afternoon. Uh, my name is JJ Spoon and I'm the director of the European Studies Center here at Pitt. I'm excited to welcome you to our first of two events launching our new Mediterranean Studies certificates. Um, more on, on that after our lecture today and Med Studies at Pitt more generally. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies, the Global Studies Center and the African Studies Program. After the lecture, you will have time for questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, and I will ask them of Dr. Rota. Uh, you can put your questions in at any point during the lecture, but you will not be able to unmute yourself and ask the questions uh, yourself. So just use one of those two features. Today, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Emmanuel Rota. Uh, Dr. Rota is an associate professor of Italian with affiliations in history and Jewish studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is also currently uh, my counterpart at, uh, at Illinois and is the director of the European Union Center. He has published articles in both English and Italian on fascism and anti-Semitism, on Primo Levi and the Holocaust, the notion of immunity and purity in the Italian nationalist tradition, on fascist colonialism and on the history of the Italian Communist Party. His first monograph, A Pact with Vichy, discussed the rise of right-wing radicalism in Italy and France during the interwar period through the intellectual biography of Angelo Tosca. His current project, A History of Laziness, Colonialism and the Modern Work Ethic, reconstructs the relationship between the representation of the lazy other and the ribs of modern capitalist spirit. Today, he will be speaking about race and racism in the early modern period in the Mediterranean region. Uh, welcome, Manuel. Thank you so much, JJ. Uh, Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Iris. I'm, I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, and I'm also so happy that Pete is starting this fantastic new certificate in Mediterranean studies. Uh, this is a project we would like to uh, copy ourselves. Uh, I've been working on the Mediterranean uh, for many, many years at this point. And um, so I'm very happy to be here for this inaugural launching moment. I also, uh, have to say that our friendship with Pete is uh, strong and we are always happy to organize uh, things together. Uh, let me go on and share my screen uh, so that uh, we can start uh, the presentation. Now, um, it, it does say to me that the host is able uh, attend the screen sharing, so that might be um, an issue we need to solve. Oh, there we are. Uh, I'm back uh, uh, with the possibility of sharing my screen. So I'll do that uh, momentarily. Here we are. Uh, again, don't pay too much attention to this image. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I don't get to see uh, all the faces of the uh, participants, uh, but uh, please uh, do not hesitate to ask me questions at the end. Uh, of course, as always, I will leave some uh, unexplained elements. And so if you have any doubts, any uh, disagreements, don't be shy. Uh, please uh, just write them in the chat and I'll try my best to answer them. Now, uh, I, I worked all my life uh, on questions of uh, anti-Semitism uh, and right-wing uh, radicalism. Uh, and at a certain point, I want to take a break. Uh, it's a very... Uh, fatiguing and uh, sometimes even complicated issue to deal with. Uh, and I started to work on the earlier uh, period precisely because I was trying to run away from fascism and other topics that had been at the center of my research for many years. And uh, surprise, surprise, <laughs> instead of running away, I ended up finding uh, questions of racism and questions of uh, 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 the ideology of racism uh, in the early modern time uh, that uh, at first surprised me because uh, like many others I had been trained to think about uh, modern racism as uh, a new phenomenon something that perhaps had roots perhaps had its origins in a previous time, but was not something that characterized the previous time. Uh, and so working on that, uh, of course, I was coming to this topic uh, like any good modernist, uh, knowing a few things about modern racism, the fact that the word itself 
uh, it's such a new coinage. It was introduced uh, only uh, in um, the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, I knew that the word appeared in uh, Oxford English Dictionary only in the 20th century. Uh, and that the concept of racism itself, uh, lacking a word, was perhaps something that had existed but had not uh, had the same kind of uh, features that uh, we start to attribute to racism uh, during the age of uh, European colonization and uh, positivism with the usual combination of uh, classification of races, uh, uh, measurements of skulls, uh, and colonization uh, of uh, and slavery, of course. Uh, but um, the more uh, I, I, I was studying this, I was also bringing with me uh, the kind of awareness of the importance that the Western tradition uh, had placed on the question of racism. And because of that, uh, as soon as I found that some of the elements that I had been accustomed to in the modern period were present in the earlier period, I started to study them as well. Uh, and of course, uh, because of uh, the combination of slavery and anti-Semitism uh, to uh, explain uh, the Western societies in the 20th century, uh, a lot of phenomena again had focused precisely on the modern period. Uh, and of course, because of the long history of research on the topic, Right now, I must say that uh, the, the most interesting new research that is coming out uh, on the modern period is not so much about how uh, racist uh, discourses were produced or even what they said. We know almost everything about them, uh, but about narratives of resistance, narratives of or counter narratives that are really at the central, uh, the center of the focus of uh, today's research when it comes to the 20th century. But uh, when we move back in history instead, uh, we are still confronting a situation where we don't know exactly how things uh, originated. And the decoupling of the notion of race from notions of uh, biological identity that uh, came naturally uh, by uh, following the logic of the linguistic terms where uh, everybody at this point, uh, even racist probably, has set the idea that uh, race is uh, a cultural construction uh, and not uh, a biological one, uh, created a situation where all of a sudden to me, the difference between uh, the, the early modern period and the late modern period was no longer that interesting. It was no longer so crucial to distinguish between uh, uh, racism based on biology and racism based on um, narratives, because the two were both narratives and had more similarities uh, than differences. And also because we are entering uh, in a world where, as, as I said, even the development of racism is probably not going to be modeled after uh, the positivist tradition that marked uh, racism in the 19th and 20th century. And so we have to be ready to look and recognize uh, some forms of racism independently of narratives of uh, 19th century and 20th century biology. And I'm not alone in that sense. Uh, I, I, I can count on uh, a great uh, historian of, of race, uh, South African historian, George Fredrickson, who in his classic uh, racism, a short history, uh, again, it's just a text that I, uh, I like to refer to because it's very compact, it's very easy to uh, use as a point of reference, wrote that um, there must be a place between the view that racism is a peculiar modern idea without much historical precedent and uh, phenomena that are simply describable as uh, tribalism or xenophobia, right? Uh, we want to explore the question of racism in the early modern age uh, without uh, making the mistake uh, of uh, losing any sort of definition of racism uh, that uh, would include the experience of the 19th and 20th century. 
uh, we can water it down and then include all sorts of, again, prejudices, uh, religious bigotry, and so on and so forth. But that wouldn't make uh, much of a service from a research perspective. But is there a space for uh, a rigorous definition of racism that uh, would include both the experience of the 19th century and the 20th century and the early modern experience? And uh, Fredrickson suggests that there is such a space, and I fully agree with him. Uh, and uh, looking for uh, this question, um, I literally stumbled uh, upon um, the document that to me still looks like the, the first document. I, I know it's always a little bit funny when historians claim that this is the first document, uh, but I haven't seen anything uh, so explicitly inscribable uh, in a, a long history of racism like the document I'm going to present to you uh, in a few moments, even though I've found many other documents that could be described as racist, uh, I also found a document that, <laughs> as an expression of anti-Arab feelings, anti-Semitic feelings, and anti-Black feelings at once, with the Mediterranean at its center, uh, that is uh, predicated not on questions of religion, but precisely on questions of race, and that is not based on, again, uh, Christian sources, but on other sources. Uh, that I, again, I, I, uh, I'm happy if somebody uh, contradicts me and finds something else, but uh, for what it's worth, I will claim that this is really the first document uh, where any objector, objective uh, reader could see uh, a, a truly racist document in the early modern age in Western society. A and the document is uh, a visual one. And th this is uh, the document uh, I am discussing here. Um, uh, you see at the bottom, I hope, uh, the description of the uh, uh, manuscript uh, from which uh, this picture is taken. Uh, it's uh, preserved in the British uh, National Library, and it's a psalter, which is to say it's a medieval collection of uh, praise in, in poetic form uh, that is uh, beautifully uh, illuminated uh, to represent uh, what uh, the uh, prayers, what the psalms uh, that are included in uh, the book represent. And again, uh, at the bottom of one of these pages, you'll find this uh, document, which uh, I will spend some time uh, reading for you uh, to show uh, why, and hopefully I'll convince you why this should be considered, uh, again, a crucial document that attests the presence of racism in the 14th century, right? So the two characters here are uh, on the left, uh, our Christian knight, uh, Richard Lionheart. Uh, if you have seen Robin Hood, uh, I suggest uh, you watch the Disney version, but you can watch whatever version you like. Uh, you know that Richard Lionheart uh, is uh, the king of England who goes to the crusade. And on the right, you see uh, the uh, general commander of the uh, Muslim troops, Saladin, uh, who is uh, the enemy, uh, the imaginary enemy uh, in this uh, conflict. So the setting is the Crusades. Uh, it's not at the time of the Crusades, as you can see, uh, Lionheart and Saladin uh, lived a couple of centuries earlier. So this is a reconstruction centuries later of an event. And we are in the 14th century, we are in England, uh, we are in a religious context that is talking about the Crusades. And what we see uh, is literally a question of unveiling. Uh, and of course, I, I'm using the, the term uh, not uh, lightly because uh, the episode uh, shows uh, not just uh, as uh, uh, we might assume uh, Saladin being defeated, uh, even though that's also the case, by the courageous Christian knight, uh, 
but at the same time, in doing so, uh, uh, Lionheart Richard unveiled uh, the face of Saladin that had been, after that moment, covered by the helmet uh, that covers the face uh, of uh, Saladin, revealing uh, a face that uh, is uh, different and again belongs to uh, a representative of a monstrous race. And I'm using that in a technical term. I'm not uh, saying that uh, as a sort of commentary. W what do I mean by the representative of a monstrous race? Now, sorry. Uh, if we look at the page, the old page, uh, where uh, this image is contained, you see it on the right, uh, and you see that it's just the second page uh, of a manuscript that also has a, a left page. And if you see this image in the context, you will see that uh, Saladin is not represented uh, as um, on, on his own uh, in, in this scene, but there are other uh, people, uh, colored people, um, that are also in the company of other monstrous people who are present on the page. In particular, uh, if we move to the left of the page, uh, you, you see uh, this uh, image uh, that uh, reveals again the context in which uh, the viewers are supposed to read uh, Saladin's episode. And as you can see, uh, there are uh, two uh, people whose uh, skin color uh, is dark. It, it's a sort of a blue color skin. Uh, and um, again, I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time discussing the image on the left, uh, although that's worth discussing uh, in some, at some length in a sort of different context. Uh, that's also an image of uh, madness, if you like. Uh, it, it's a kind of traditional representation of uh, uh, the Oriental uh, as a madman uh, carried by, uh, by people in a sort of way in which a, a, an Oriental king and a madman person would be. But next to uh, our uh, blue skinned um, human, you also see unmistakably uh, uh, somebody dressed in human clothes, but with dog-like features. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, the, the first assumption for us would be to assume that there is a little bit of a decorative element here, but this element actually is an important giveaway uh, if uh, you are familiar uh, and if you're not, it's my job to make you familiar uh, with the classical tradition that has produced uh, the image of uh, the dog man. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, giving you two quotations. Uh, I kept one in Latin uh, just to show you that I also speak Latin. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I'm actually just lazy. I didn't want to translate it. And so I kept it in the original. Uh, but the first one uh, is uh, um, a quotation from a, a Greek source uh, that shows you how old uh, this image that ends up in the uh, European 14th century, how long this tradition goes back. Uh, and it's by uh, a Greek author uh, of the 5th century before the current era. Uh, so we are talking about uh, a description that by the time it reaches England in the 14th century is 2000 years old. Uh, and this is uh, what this Greek author says. Uh, they say uh, uh, that on the mountains of India live animals who have the heads of dogs. They wear elegant clothes. They make out of white animals and they don't speak any language but bark like dogs. They live on the mountains around the river Indo and they are dark. Right. So. Uh, if you, again, look at the image of uh, our um, character here on the right, you immediately can see how uh, some of the features are preserved. The dog, the human dog is dressed in elegant dresses, 
and he's addressing somebody, uh, but is in between a dog and a human. Uh, the second, um, uh, the, the second uh, quotation is there mostly to prove uh, the continuity of this tradition uh, is by uh, a um, uh, Latin author uh, in the early uh, medieval period uh, who wrote a history of the Longobard people, where again he made reference to the so called Chinochefalos, the uh, people with uh, heads like dogs. Uh, who are uh, men with the head of dogs, right? Uh, as canini capitis hominis, um, human beings uh, with the head uh, of a dog. Uh, and uh, this long tradition, again, uh, of uh, uh, these uh, races uh, placed in Asia uh, or in Africa uh, or uh, uh, then later on uh, in uh, the New World uh, is the context that the viewers of this image uh, would have immediately or uh, after some guidance recognized as uh, the moment where uh, Saladin is revealed to be uh, close in color and similar to the other uh, races that are between the human and the animal uh, that are represented on uh, the next page. So this moment of revelation where uh, Saladin is unmasked, is unveiled, is a moment that signals uh, not just the presence of an enemy, but the presence of somebody whose race is similar to that of the monstrous race of uh, humans with a dog face. Um, now, the, op the episode, of course, is also uh, obviously racist uh, in connecting uh, some uh, physical features to moral disorders. Um, any, uh, anybody who studies racism uh, in uh, the modern period or in the early modern period and any other period uh, knows that the question of racism in the Western tradition is often a question of aesthetics. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, some physical features are out of proportion, some physical features are uh, too big or too small or uh, not uh, as human as they should be. Uh, and this uh, lack of proportion, the physical features that reveals uh, ugliness outside also reveals the ugliness of the inside. Uh, so again, we have here uh, another important trope, another important figure uh, of the tradition of Western racism, the unveiling of somebody who belongs to a different race and the features of the face that is revealed are uh, out of scale, out of proportion. The nose, the lips are a sign of a moral characteristics. Uh, as you can see, the color of the skin uh, is combined with, uh, again, uh, uh, very visible lips uh, and a very visible nose, uh, a trope, of course, uh, we are unfortunately all very familiar with. So uh, there is another element, right? Uh, the, 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 the person who, uh, made this uh, illumination, uh, wanted to be absolutely sure <laughs> that the viewers wouldn't miss the significance uh, of what they were witnessing. And um, interestingly enough, uh, on the shield, uh, I hope you can see it well, uh, tell me if you don't, uh, we see that what is unveiled uh, by uh, which a Lionheart attack is also replicated uh, on the shield as the insignia, as the symbol of who Saladin stands for. And here you have uh, two functions that are uh, at once operational here. Uh, one again is uh, to make sure that uh, the reference to blackness is reinforced, is repeated, but, but also because on the shield, uh, as if you are familiar with the Crusaders and particularly with even the Disney image of Richard Lionheart, 
you know that one of the symbols of the Crusaders was precisely to have a cross uh, or another religious symbol on their uniform uh, so that they would represent uh, Christianity in the fight against Islam. But here instead, uh, you don't have uh, any symbol of Islam or anything that might be symbolic of a religious affiliation, but on the shield, you have a racial component that basically uh, is telling the reader uh, very explicitly, Saladin is fighting in the name of the black people represented on his shield, the, the races, the monstrous races that are uh, present on the page, uh, and this is not a religious question. This is a question of somebody who is representing uh, a racial uh, fight. So no religious symbolism, uh, not the half moon of Islam or, or anything else, but really a, a black face uh, as uh, the insignia uh, for which Saladin is fighting. And, and of course, uh, to, to uh, make things easy for us, uh, this is not just uh, a trope of one form of Western racism. And the image itself contains the three major pillars of Western racism that uh, historically is composed by uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, uh, feelings. Uh, I prefer anti-Arab feelings here rather than anti-Islam feelings. I think there is a real question of the Arabs rather than just Islam, uh, operational. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Arab feelings, and anti-Black feelings. Uh, if you uh, are again familiar with uh, medieval tropes, uh, the nose, the, the shape of the nose uh, would have immediately be readable uh, to uh, um, the Christians who would see this image as a Semitic nose. Uh, again, uh, it, it's hard to say if uh, the question was the fact that because of uh, aesthetic considerations, this disorder of the soul is represented to, through these exaggerated features. Uh, it, uh, the author had explicitly in mind the question of anti-Semitism, and not, but nonetheless, it's obvious to anybody that this nose is a nose that had uh, an unfortunate long tradition uh, in Western society. Finally, uh, we have been spending quite some time uh, on this source, but I think uh, it's really worth considering for its importance. Uh, we also have um, an another crucial element that constitutes racism, which is to say uh, the constitution of uh, whiteness in this specific case, uh, and not just the constitution of blackness. Um, I think we, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, racism, as you can see, doesn't come from uh, the encounter with otherness uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Mediterranean, uh, the encounter with the other uh, is an everyday situation, but it's constitutive of the other uh, as it's constitutive of a uh, racial identity. And here, uh, it's not just the unveiling uh, of Saladin uh, that signifies uh, the, the racial identity uh, that uh, we are confronting, but also the not unveiling of uh, Richard that would allow a, any viewer uh, to uh, uh, identify potentially uh, with uh, the uh, knight uh, imagining yourself under the helmet there uh, in this mortal fight. And again, the presence of the face would have had some specific features where the use of the helmet that doesn't need to be unveiled, allow you to imagine literally as a white person who is watching the scene uh, on the side of this uh, anonymous uh, hero. So a few points so far uh, that uh, I think I made through uh, 
uh, this source, again, it's not the only source, of course, uh, but it's, uh, it's one source that is so overwhelmingly uh, readable within a racist tradition that it's worth spending some time on. Uh, and what we can see here, of course, is the centrality from the beginning uh, of the question of the Mediterranean. Uh, first of all, it's a question of the Crusades, um, uh, the, the, the question of uh, this conflict between uh, Europe and uh, the southern shore of the Mediterranean uh, and its ideological implications that really left uh, a very long uh, mark uh, in uh, uh, the Western tradition to the point that, again, I, I think I, uh, I was uh, uh, reading something the other day uh, about Ruth Ginsburg and somebody who was uh, without any sense of uh, propriety was describing her as a crusader for women's rights, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the metaphor, uh, is uh, still very powerful today. Uh, but again, this question of this uh, conflict that uh, created this space for a, a permanent distinction between the northern shore and the southern shore of the Mediterranean uh, is the necessary setting for this form of, of racism. And also uh, the Mediterranean precisely as a meeting place. Uh, I think uh, we have been uh, a little bit bombarded by uh, notions uh, of the Mediterranean that are uh, correct, but are at the same time a little bit um, too positive or uh, they want to push a really positive spin uh, on the, the, the Mediterranean as a meeting place of people, a place where uh, people used to get along a place where different religions could live together. There is that sometimes, but uh, there is also this very strong uh, European feeling of the Mediterranean as a place where Europe meets uh, an area that puts it in contact with an hostile outside world. Uh, it's within the Mediterranean context that you run into Saladin and through Saladin you run into the black people of Africa and through Saladin and this conflict, you run into uh, the blue people, the dark people of India and the monstrous races that inhabit the world outside of Europe, uh, which is described uh, by a long uh, tradition that again, goes back to Greek and Roman mythology up to a certain point uh, as a space where the monsters have been subdued, the monsters have been eliminated, but outside in the other area, in the other, in the rest of the world, you still run into these monstrous races and the Mediterranean as such becomes an area uh, of danger and areas where uh, you could, again, run into somebody who has uh, monstrous features. Now, I also, uh, want to uh, move to the next uh, component of my talk today, uh, which is a, a very uh, traditional distinction between uh, religious feelings, uh, religious bigotry in some cases, uh, and racism, uh, to, to say that uh, in the spirit of what uh, the researchers who want to maintain a rigorous definition of what racism is without again confusing racism uh, with uh, other forms of uh, hostility or prejudice. Uh, when we are talking about this question and even in that image, even though we are moving within a very religious context, it's a crusade, uh, is um, the, the fight between uh, Muslims and Christians. Nonetheless, the crucial element is not uh, the religious element, but it's another racial element. And it's so because, again, of the presence of uh, sources that are pre-Christian or non-Christian at all. Uh, in this specific case, uh, the Greek sources and the Roman sources uh, are the tradition that, particularly through Pliny the Elder, 
uh, was incredibly alive and incredibly strong in Europe between the 14th and 15th and the 16th century. So, so I, I think sometimes uh, even a smart uh, historians tend to see the Middle Ages as a place where the Western tradition was uh, exclusively uh, motivated or inspired by the Bible. Uh, this happens particularly uh, when we are discussing not so much European scholars as American scholars who have, again, a tendency of, of seeing the Middle Ages sometimes as a representation of a uh, form of religious uh, extremism uh, that uh, characterizes the entire uh, world of understanding. But the Middle Ages, the European Middle Ages, had access to other sources and they used them. Uh, they used them when the Bible was not useful to make sense of what they were experiencing. And in the case of, again, this racial conflict, we have seen how uh, an older tradition, a Greek tradition could be mobilized uh, to create a new understanding of uh, a racial conflict. Particularly, this, I want to stress this point particularly because uh, it it becomes crucial for uh, our next step, which is to say uh, what happens between the end of the Middle Ages and the ages of exploration. Uh, now you have to put yourself uh, in uh, the shoes of the people who like uh, the ones in the painting I have behind me today uh, would uh, uh, go around the world, again, leaving the tame controlled space of Europe uh, to discover the world and their terror uh, for the unknown, their terror for uh, something that had absolutely no, no space uh, in their imagination other than uh, something very similar to science fiction. Uh, it, it's hard to resist the temptation of making the comparison between uh, the monstrous races uh, of uh, India or Africa described by Pliny and uh, the representation of Martians or uh, other extraterrestrial hostile forms of life uh, that we still imagine when we are discussing the question of exploring uh, the outside space. And precisely because this question of exploring was so terrifying, the question of having some sort of guide, some sort of text that would provide reassurance uh, was uh, crucial and that reactivated very, very strongly uh, this question of the presence of uh, monstrous races outside of Europe uh, that people uh, expected to find uh, and sometimes found, sometimes invented, sometimes uh, changing Western traditions, uh, even from a linguistic perspective, as in the case of uh, the transformation of the anthropophagi, uh, the people with other people of the Greek and Latin tradition into the cannibals, the inhabitants of uh, an island in the new world where uh, all of a sudden the same figure, uh, the same behavior is uh, transformed from a classical source into a new world source, but with the same kind of characteristics. Now, in order to show continuity, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the modern age and particularly I want to make a little bit of this jump by going ahead 100 years uh, and go to Portugal and particularly to the figure of Prince Harry the Navigator uh, who uh, is surprisingly in continuity with this tradition uh, he is described by his most famous biographer as a conservative, strangely medieval figure, even though we are in the 15th century. Henry the Navigator, of course, is the prince that conquered Ceuta uh, and then uh, started the uh, conquest uh, of uh, West Africa uh, in the name of Portugal and who introduced uh, a new um, uh, very profitable slave trade in Portugal uh, without uh, the mediation uh, of uh, local uh, slave trade. So Harry the Navigator, if you are a 19th or 20th century person, perhaps you're not familiar with him, 
but he, he was really a crucial figure uh, in the uh, age of exploration. And it's because of his idea that the Crusades had to be continued, uh, that we had uh, the ex Portuguese expansion in Africa, and then we have the beginning of the exploration of West Africa and the introduction of slave trade uh, in Europe again uh, as a major uh, economic endeavor. And uh, uh, Harry the Navigator was busy fighting or ordering other people to fight, but he had also an official biographer uh, whose name was Zurara or Azurara, who is often indicated as a, another likely source uh, of um, Western, uh, the appearance of anti-Black Western racism uh, because of his uh, description of the first uh, slave trade and his inability uh, to um, uh, maintain a fully Christian narrative, I would say, uh, when it comes to the question of slavery. Uh, the Zurara uh, wrote a, a couple of uh, crucial books, again, the Siege and Capture of Ceuta, and then his masterpiece, The Chronicle Discovery and Conquest of uh, Guinea. Uh, and again, like his uh, master, his inspirator, he's a member of this o o military order of Christ, which is the Portuguese attempt uh, to have uh, the um, um, uh, the military order uh, of the Crusaders uh, survived the end of the Crusade, right? Uh, th these are the Templars uh, that once the Templars are closed, uh, the Portuguese try to keep alive by changing the name and but maintaining the spirit and maintaining the same kind of uh, inspiration. Now, uh, w when we look at uh, the, the question of uh, Azurara representation of uh, the people they had captured, we see how uh, this question of uh, medieval, not Christian sources necessarily, although some of them Christianizable, uh, is crucial to his understanding of why uh, slavery was possible. And again, we, we see th this question of the reference to bestial laziness, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why I got interested in Azurara's work, this question of laziness, uh, and this question of uh, these uh, human beings that are in between the human and the beast. Uh, and again, we would be tempted to read this as metaphors or simple insults if we had not seen uh, the, the very reality uh, of the imagination of uh, some of these races as in between uh, humans and beasts. Um, and again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's not a, a minor element for the justification of, of slavery because uh, the medieval justification of slavery according to Thomas Aquinas, who was the, the crucial uh, philosopher who could be invoked uh, to talk about slavery at this point, could, could not be based on natural reason. So, uh, of course, religion is out of the question. Uh, Aquinas is against the idea of a permanent slavery. So he said there is no way you can justify slavery uh, on the basis of uh, a scientific argument, which is natural reason. But he says, slavery can be justified uh, if not uh, as a logical argument, but as an educational one. Uh, and it, it, can be, uh, it can be justified if there is a benefit uh, for the slave, uh, as there is a benefit uh, if a child is educated by parent and if a man that is superior to the other animals because he's made in God's image, uh, the other animals are subject to man's domination. Uh, so so the, this question of the non-human nature uh, of, of some of, um, uh, of the slaves captured uh, becomes uh, crucial for uh, the understanding of uh, why racism and slavery had to go together uh, as a permanent feature, even if a slave would convert to Christianity, or even if uh, culturally uh, the person 
was willing to adopt uh, other forms, uh, European forms of life. So th this question is not a metaphor. The introduction of monster races between human and, and animals justifies slavery. Uh, it's the ultimate justification of slavery. Uh, again, uh, this is the moment when I have to say that uh, I'm really not in agreement instead with Fredrickson here. Uh, he suggests that uh, in the initial purchase and transport of African slaves by Europeans could easily be justified in terms of religious and legal status without recourse to an explicit racism. Uh, I think that's, that's historically inaccurate. Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope, uh, right at the time when Azurara is writing his chronicle and he's trying to justify slavery on the basis of Aquinas and on the basis of the semi-bestial status uh, or the bestial status of the humans captured, uh, also issued a, a bull uh, exactly when uh, Azurara is writing that explicitly forbade the enslavement of, uh, native, of the natives in the Canary. Uh, as we know, uh, the Catholic Church had a, a little bit of ambiguity, multiple uh, moments, but at the same time, the Catholic Church always refused to give uh, its seal of approval to the idea of permanent slavery as something theologically justified. And again, as in the case of Azurara, we found a situation where uh, the question of slavery had to be reconstructed not on the basis of religion, not on the basis of natural reasoning, which is to say scientific reasoning, uh, but had to be justified on the basis of usefulness uh, on the question of uh, a, a, a sort of great chain of beings where uh, Europeans were at the top uh, and uh, people of other races would be closer to animals and as such subject to human domination. Now, nothing shows better, I think, and this is really uh, the last part of my talk, the uh, problem that this early apologist of slavery uh, and racism had in finding uh, Christian sources then they're grasping for sources of any kind that could justify what they were doing. Uh, and uh, in particular, in the case of Azurara, uh, I, I think it's very, very interesting the fact that uh, other than uh, Aquinas, he became immediately sensitive to uh, an argument that was introduced not by a Christian, not by the Pope, but by an Arab uh, captive who presented the argument uh, in Portugal uh, in order to free himself from captivity. Uh, not again on the basis of some natural rights, but on the basis of an exchange between himself and some black slaves. So in chapter 16, uh, we uh, of uh, the discovery and conquest of Guinea, uh, we find, again, a very lengthy description of this dialogue uh, where uh, the um, Arab captive uh, says, uh, I can, if you let me go, I can give you six black moors. And he's saying also, that's not just a question of uh, trading quantity, but also that he uh, uh, would do that even though these uh, black moors uh, are also Muslims because uh, he believes that because of uh, the so-called curse of Ham, uh, the uh, African, black Africans are naturally slaves and uh, should be subject to slavery uh, as a result of their uh, being cursed uh, uh, and this curse being inscribed in their own nature. Uh, Here you have uh, uh, another passage. For as the Moor told him, the last, the least they would give for them would be ten Moors, and it was better to save ten souls than three. So the, the Moors, uh, again, the, the Muslim here or here is is using two different kind of arguments, and Azurara 
reports dutifully both of them. On one hand, this question of numbers, uh, which is fully meant for the Christians, uh, you can save 10 souls instead of one, which also means you can have 10 slaves instead of one. Uh, but also the previous argument, which is to say, um, if you think about me and you think about the black slaves I'm going to give you in exchange of me, you should think that the black slaves are meant to be slaves, whereas I'm not. Now, uh, we have uh, on this question of the curse of Ham, this question of these uh, racial hierarchies, uh, a bibliography we can rely on, in particular, David Goldenberg, uh, extensive research on the curse of Ham. Uh, well, we know uh, that uh, the curse of Ham is not really uh, uh, present in early Christian sources, that instead becomes very, very present uh, in uh, uh, first uh, Muslim sources and then uh, through contact with uh, um, the Arab world uh, in the eastern side of uh, the West, which is to say in the Orthodox Church. But if we look at the question of uh, the presence of the curse of Ham, uh, in the Western tradition, uh, in a place like Portugal, Italy, France, or, or Germany, it doesn't appear uh, until Zurara's uh, text. That, that's actually the first time that Goldenberg says, uh, we find a reference to this question of the curse of Han. Uh, and so we are uh, in a situation where uh, we are finally uh, finding another source that is also another Mediterranean source and al allows us to see very, very clearly how uh, within this context of the Mediterranean there is cultural exchange, but also some of this cultural exchange uh, is not the kind of cultural exchange we are uh, used to think of when we want to put a positive spin on the Mediterranean. Uh, it's not the kind, kind of cultural comprehension. Uh, but it's the notion of holy war or the notion of uh, slavery and racial hierarchies sometimes that are transmitted uh, from the north south uh, in, from the north to the south or vice versa. So a few conclusions because I think um, I'm getting close to uh, the, the end of my talk here. Uh, racism as an ideology, I think. Uh, should be evident from my talk. Uh, I hope I convinced you. It sits in the West before the modern era. Uh, I think we should abandon uh, the, the idea that racism is something that starts with the scientific revolution. Um, we should treat this question of biology uh, as a crucial question. But as we imagine, again, uh, sitting on this metaphor of uh, other forms of life in outer space, uh, we should imagine that other centuries before the scientific turn had notions of biology, had notions of, of physical nature that would mobilize to talk about racism. They are different than the ones that were created in the 18th century or 17th century between France and, and, uh, and the rest of the world, but nonetheless, they did have a notion of biology uh, and these notions of biology, particularly these notions of other races could be mobilized in moments of usefulness. That if we are looking for a moment when racism starts to receive its formulation, we have to look at the Mediterranean as, as a place of permanent conflict, as a place of permanent Islamophobia, permanent anti-Semitism, uh, permanent uh, sort of definition of the borders of Europe uh, as uh, opposed to a binary other that is constructed so that Europeans could imagine themselves under the helmet of Richard Lionheart. That uh, in its firm's first appearances, uh, we have already a form of enmity that is not based on religion, even though religion is actually uh, colonized or included in the narrative. Uh, I would say that, again, uh, in the image uh, I started from, or in Azurara's attempt to mobilize whatever he could, including the Bible, to justify slavery, 
it's religion that is brought into the racist narrative, uh, not vice versa. Uh, and finally, uh, in this sense, uh, that this question of uh, justification of racism uh, and slavery, in particular the question of justification of slavery and conflicts uh, in the age of exploration, uh, the Europeans uh, had to rely on uh, any source they could find, including other traditions of uh, racial thinking, if not explicitly racist thinking, which is another point of disagreement between uh, Fredrickson and me. Uh, he suggested, unfortunately, Fredrickson is dead, so he cannot reply to me. He was a fantastic historian, so uh, I'm picking my uh, rival here above my stature. Uh, but he suggested, of course, that uh, racism is inherently only a Western tradition. Whereas, as I hoped, I show to you even briefly, it's at least a Mediterranean tradition that includes communications between the Arab world and Europe and is capable of cross-fertilizing uh, both traditions, either through colonialism or through forms of communication uh, from early modern period to the contemporary age. And with this, uh, I think, I'm done, uh, and I hope I stayed in my allotted time. Perhaps I even went too far. What should I do? Pause share, go back. Uh, stop sharing, you can hit that. Did button. I stop or? or uh, I no, stop? It's, there okay, you go. Very good. Perfect. Great. Mm. Oh, and we've lost you too. <laughs> oh. There oh, you are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating talk. And there's there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, questions already posted in, in the chat. So um, we're going to do uh, Q&A a couple of different ways. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in into the chat and I can read it to um, uh, share it with Dr. Rota. Um, we've also um, actually now can, it, um, you can ask questions uh, yourself. And so if you, if you would like to do that, you can raise your hand and I will then unmute you. So two ways, to, however you'd like to, to, to ask a question. Um, so I'm gonna start um, from uh, some of the questions that were asked. Um, earlier on in the discussion. Um, and I will start with this one um, and I will read it. Um, uh, so uh, the question or the comment is, I think it might be helpful to discern the Western Mediterranean from the Eastern Mediterranean, especially the lands under the Byzantine Empire, where the other was actually revered. For example, the saints from Ethiopia, Northern Africa, Asia Minor, and the Caucasus, who were not white, yet were celebrated as saints in official services of the Eastern Christian churches. Um, so. Uh, your thoughts on, on on that on that comment? Again, uh, there is a very well documented, for instance, uh, black black Ophelia in the West as well. Uh, so, so again, uh, we are not talking about hegemonic traditions here. Uh, so, if we are looking for uh, the common sense of both the East and the West in the 14th century we will go very, very far uh, from these images, right? Uh, let's not forget that, uh, again, uh, both uh, the Italian scientists in the 14th century uh, and somebody like uh, Zurara in the 15th century uh, still believed very, very explicitly that uh, the color of the skin was just uh, a matter of exposure to the sun. So if somebody from, uh, let's say, France moved to uh, Africa, his sons will be black. Uh, again, and we have multiple sort of references to this idea of mobility. But again, that, that's not very different than the situation today, right? I mean, uh, you could go to New York and if you were looking for racists, you wouldn't find many. Uh, but you will find them, uh, and, and so that, that's that's what's interesting. So I, I think the question uh, is correct in this, in pointing out uh, not not so much a difference. Uh, I think uh, it's also important to remember that 
it's in the eastern side of the Mediterranean, uh, at least uh, according to um, the, the study uh, on the course of harm I, I, I quoted, that precisely notions of blackness and, and, and natural slavery, either through Aristotelism or through biblical references were also kept alive. Uh, so I, I think uh, it's not so much a question of East versus West as much as a question of uh, the, the overall hegemonic narrative of these societies that was not racist, but the presence of potential racist narratives within them. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's, let me scroll through. Um, so we have uh, a couple of questions, um, and I'll, I'll read read them both and take them as, as, as you wish. Uh, so the first question is, what do you think the phrase black Moors means in the quote from Zarara? After all, the term Moor is slippery and can refer to religion, Muslim, race, black, or geography, North Africa. And secondly, I'll just, I'll read both of them and you can <laughs> take them in turn. Uh, could you talk a bit more about how religion also served as a racial or if you prefer racialized category in the early modern period? In early modern Iberia, it was common, for instance, to refer to the Jewish or Muslim race. Thank you. So lots to discuss. Right. So I, I think these are two different important questions. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the more, more um, again, it, it was, uh, I think, a good sign of the fact that uh, the reference was not uh, automatically racialized. Uh, or it, there was a little bit of confusion, right? There is uh, not uh, not a clear category. This is, of course, uh, this is a debate that has received a lot of attention when it comes to Othello because of Shakespeare. Is uh, Othello a black person or not? Uh, the text seems to suggest very strongly that Othello, for instance, was, and this question of conversion, this question of uh, can uh, a black man who converts to Christianity, who becomes the best potential Venetian general, marry my daughter, <laughs> is a crucial question throughout the early modern period. Uh, but even, uh, but in that case, like, uh, like in the case of Othello, like in the case of this reference to the black Moors, uh, th there is also a sort of surplus that all of a sudden becomes uh, operative, right? So more is already a sort of reference to blackness, but that's no longer enough because the moment when you introduce this idea that it's race and not just religion, even though you have used the two interchangeably, it's a surplus, it's a nose, it's a lips, it's a color, it's a shield, it's this multiplication of um, uh, signifiers that become uh, crucial. So, so to, to answer your question, um, it's very important for the reader that he specifies black Moors because for, for the first time, he's distinguishing between traditional Moors that are racially indistinguishable one from the other and the Arabs that claim, oh, but there are the black Moors who are worse than we are. So you should take them because they are naturally slaves. Now, when it comes to the question of, uh, uh, religion, um, perhaps the, 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 the question again asks me to address uh, uh, the, the question of other forms of Islamophobia, for instance. Is, is that, uh, can you, JJ, can you repeat the question a little bit? I got lost in all. Sure, yeah, no, 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 no problem. <laughs> I got lost in Othello as well. Um, so uh, could you talk a bit more about how religion also served as a racial or racialized category in the early modern period? Right, but religion, to, to be honest with you, uh, it's really the complication, right? It, it's, it's a practical complication. Uh, uh, so Azurara tells a story of the capturing of a uh, hundred, give or take, uh, Africans. Uh, many more are killed, hundreds survive. They make it back to Portugal. And he's really heartbroken, uh, I have no sympathy for him, uh, but he's heartbroken nonetheless because he has to describe the first slave market. And he sees that contrary to tradition up to that point, families are divided, some children are sent in different 
places than their parents, mothers, uh, divided by their children. It's really a heartbreaking description. And he also is a little bit puzzled by what he witnessed. Two of these captured are immediately given to a monastery uh, as a tribute. Uh, but then what happens when they convert? What happens once they become Christian? How do you maintain slavery if uh, conversion is possible? Once again, th this question of the possibility of conversion destabilizes an entire sort of racial hierarchy if it's based on religion. So th this question of a, a surplus. So religion in itself is never enough. The color of the skin supplies the surplus that allows people to maintain hierarchies despite conversion. And of course, the Spanish case with the Reconquista is another fantastic case where, again, the, the, this question of uh, the, the, the purity of the blood and, and, and the question of how do you make sure that converted people are really converted uh, and, and maintain their faith uh, if, if they are racially unstable uh, is a problem. It is a problem. Great, thank you. Um, so next, we uh, we have a question um, from a from a student who's actually in my in my comparative politics course. Um, so he says uh, in our comparative politics course, we're uh, we're often asked to compare and contrast different nations with our own. Specifically, in the United States, the Three Fifths Clause and the Fugitive Slave Act were integral in the con construction of the U.S. Constitution. The American perception of slaves was that of lesser um, than or subhuman. Would you say Amer uh, would you say European racism and this early modern racism that you've been talking about led to and translated to American racism? Right. So, so th 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 that's an excellent question in the sense that what I'm also looking for is a sort of unified theory uh, of racism. Uh, Europeans, uh, as you probably know, uh, experienced anti-Semitism as the most devastating form of racism in the 20th century, as Americans instead experienced uh, Jim Crow and, and uh, segregation as the most devastating uh, experience of racism in the 20th century. And this has created two uh, traditions that don't seem to be very good at communicating. Uh, where, well, for instance, the Europeans who still imagine racism as the result of the positivist turn of the 19th century uh, always assume that if the state does not collect information about race, if we do not categorize, racism will go away uh, and it disappears because it's a result of this uh, pseudoscience that categorizes people. Uh, whereas in the case of slavery, uh, of course, uh, the, the situation uh, is a question of reparation, the question of recognizing the, the permanent uh, violence that uh, racism and slavery uh, perpetrated and how to overcome the consequences of this. So within these two traditions, sometimes it's hard for us uh, to see how uh, in a document at the origin of, of this tradition, uh, anti-blackness, anti-Semitism, anti-Islamophobia or anti-Arab feelings were still one single thing that then got kind of specified in different idioms, uh, a little bit like uh, American English is different than English uh, spoken in Australia or in South Africa, but still there is uh, so much in common there that, that can be reconstructed. Having said so, again, if you are studying the 20th century or the, or the 19th century, my recommendation would be forget about racism, don't study racism uh, in terms of what the racists say, who cares about what a bunch of racist white doctors said about other people, study the resistance to racism, uh, which is much more interesting, which I would love to study in the early modern period, but simply the sources have been completely erased and so they are not available to us. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have another question, um, which is, uh, what about the clannish behaviors and racism indigenous to the Amerindians or the Central American, South American peoples? These predate the 14th century Europeans. 
I, I'm tempted to ask more, right? Uh, <laughs> in, in the sense that um, to be interested to see what are the sources to, to make such a claim. Uh, it's so hard for me to make a claim about the racism of Europe in the 14th century. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not aware of uh, anything that could be classified as racist in that context. Again, it, it, but I'm not saying that it, there is none. I'm just saying that I'm not aware. So I, I would like to hear more. What, what I want to uh, underline, though, is that we have to be careful in um, making a, a strong distinction between ideas of caste, even ideas of social stability uh, that uh, prevent uh, the intermarriage between an, an aristocrat and a commoner. Uh, even today somehow, right? I mean, if you are the queen of England, if you marry a commoner, you are in trouble, right? There is a, a question of uh, uh, aristocracy and divisions within societies or caste divisions that are certainly relevant. Uh, I, I think the, the question of uh, a hierarchy of races, though, uh, would be a little bit more uh, specific than that, like, again, in the case of our monstrous races, right? Uh, you don't just have to be a commoner who doesn't mix with another race, but you have to be a little bit of a monster, somebody who is in between the human and the animal. Uh, a Christian commoner would not be allowed to marry a, a duchess or, or, or a king, but that wouldn't make that person less of a human. Whereas in the case of Saladin, I think there is clearly the reference to the fact that this person is not really like us, not really a human. Thank you. Um, if there are other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Again, you can also, also raise your hand. Um, and, and as uh, I, we wait to see if there are any others, I just I want to, to, so to mention, and I think for me, what's so interesting is we're in this moment, of course, in the U.S., but in Europe, where race really has is 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 in our is in, in our faces in a way that, not that it hasn't been, in, but just in terms of uh, many of the events that have happened in you know in the U.S. and the protests following the murder of George Floyd, et cetera, in the U.S. as well as in Europe, and just to to sort of think about the historical connections, right? As we think about structural racism in the U.S., we know, of course, in in, in the context of Europe. Um, and we look at you know, the, the protests and the demonstrations um, from this past summer, obviously going back a couple of years with the Roads Must Fall movement, et cetera. But I think it's really important why this you know, has it really given me a lot to, to think about, especially as a, as a political scientist who thinks very much in the present, is sort of these long traditions. And to keep in, and to remember that, you know, as we all know, history matters, right? And if we want to understand sort of politics today and where so much of this is coming from, it's not even turning back 20 or 30 years, but hundreds, many hundreds of years, and to really understand sort of the sources of, 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 of all of these things. And so for me, it's this has been a really interesting to kind of, you know, think, you know, look at some of these examples um, from the 14th century, earlier, et cetera, that really in some ways is very much kind of the foundations for much of the reaction that we're seeing, you know, we're seeing today. Um, right, JJ, th thank you so much. I, I think you're absolutely right. I would also like to add that there are other elements that didn't make into my presentation also for the sake of time, but I think the, the question of state formation uh, in this moment in history also plays a crucial part. And so does the question of um, the, the most important event that of course happened to Europe, which is that by chance, by pure chance, you stumbled upon a continent and Europe at the time is an underpopulated uh, continent uh, that is chronically lacking uh, the manpower to develop this new land that they are all of a sudden conquering. And they have to come up with uh, f forms of social organization that would allow the maximization of resources, uh, including taxation, including uh, questions of categorization, preventing people from moving, and also creating a sort of connection between uh, narratives of uh, work and now and, and narratives of ownership. Who is entitled to the land? Those who produce through the land, through work. So if the natives do not exploit the land to its maximum capacity, then it belongs to us uh, because we are working hard 
uh, and as people work hard, we can take care of these lazy others who are outside. Uh, this narrative of laziness, for instance, uh, marked uh, the entire history of uh, not only European expansion, but also of racism even today and and you find it sometimes in unexpected sources uh, again even in some well-meaning people who would say oh but there are lazy people between oh, white people and lazy people between black people but the question is this question of laziness as a form of uh, justification for colonization uh, mm -hmm. that is so crucial in state formation and in the kind of accumulation of capital that characterizes our entire history Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's an important part of the connection here between, uh, you know, what you've discussed and sort of bringing it, you know, forward in terms of thinking of state formation and thinking of imperialism, colonialism, formation of democracy, et cetera, and all of these, all of these kinds of things as well. Um, I think, uh, let's see, look to see if we have any other, any other questions. I think, uh, I think, maybe the, the end, I uh, don't see any other questions. So um, I want to thank you very much. And we've gotten, of course, several, several uh, thank yous from, uh, from our audience members as well for a, a really insightful and, and fantastic presentation and really giving us some, you know, lots to think about, but also I think importantly is this, you know, our last sort of comments uh, where we're just really connecting um, you know, the past with the present, which I think, you know, is something that uh, we're all perhaps thinking about and that's really important, especially at this moment. And to kind of circle, you know, back to uh, the, the the launch of these new uh, certificate programs that we're doing here in Mediterranean studies, which is really to connect sort of, again, one of the major themes is connecting the, you know, the, the past with, with the present in really terms of understanding these bigger questions of, state formation and citizenship and relationships uh, between uh, states and individuals and who the other is and how that affects not only um, things in the, in the past, but also the present. So thank you so much for, for a really great talk. Um, so I want to um, also invite um, any of you in the audience to our second event, which is part of our, our launch of, the, of these new certificates, which will be tomorrow. And I think we have a slide uh, if one of my colleagues wants to uh, share their screen, hopefully, uh, with information about that. But we are going to be having, as, as, uh, as uh, and I think here it is. <laughs> um, and let's see, there we go. Um, so we will be having a uh, panel tomorrow made up of uh, Pitt faculty and, uh, and, PH and a PhD student. Um, in which they will be discussing their own research and teaching and how it relates to the region and the kinds of questions that scholars interested in the Mediterranean region uh, here at Pitt specifically are interested in. So I would encourage uh, any of you to, to please join us at uh, 2.30 tomorrow. Um, I don't need to say the location because all locations are <laughs> in front of your computer. Um, and I think there's registration information in the chat. Um, and please share if there are any faculty here, please share um, this with your students as well. Well, um, and all, all will be welcome. So thank you again, and thank you again to uh, Dr. Rota. It's so wonderful to have you here. Uh, he invited me to Illinois last, uh, last spring for a talk, so it's very nice to be able to reciprocate, at least in the virtual world, and I hope to be able to have you and host you on campus uh, at some point uh, in the not too distant future. So thank you again, and thank you to everyone for, for joining us. Thank you so much.